face, and that is wilderness and tourism. And the amazing thing is that tourism is often seen as the Hail Mary to solve every kind of problems, challenges we have in the rural landscape, but we also have also the friction with nature protection. Now, I start off with a couple of words about who we are, and I don't think we have to go through the schedule. It's a small little group. I will take about 30 to 40 minutes, and I would like to have it as interactive as possible. A few words about myself. Um, yeah, I lost about 20, no, 40 kilos since that photo was taken. I am not from the nature conservation arena. I actually come out of international marketing. I worked for the software industry. I lived in Canada for most of my life and um, basically entered the nature conservation field in 2012, 2012, when I um, was the Austin representative to a UNWTO uh, uh, session on tourism and biodiversity. And it kind of got me hooked. And then in 2013, 14, when Pan Park, which was the predecessor organization of the European Wilderness Society, was sent into bankruptcy by WWF Netherlands, I was one of the founding members of starting up the European Wilderness Society. And I found a new passion. Now we live in a very touristic area in the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve in the Lungau. So many of the challenges I talk about are firsthand uh, information that we had here, experienced ourselves, and are struggling with. Who is the European Wilderness Society? Uh, I already alluded, we basically got started in 2014 by the individuals who, after 20 years of promoting the wilderness concept in Europe, were kind of left hanging by the decision of WWF Netherlands to stop this project, and then decided to start their own pan-European wilderness-focused nonprofit organization. And we are a team, multicultural, I mean, we have got Nick, who is a Dutch, we have Germans, we have Slovakians, we have Hungarians, we have Spanish, we have Irina in Ushorod, who is Ukrainian. So there's a whole bunch of us. And the majority is actually not nature conservationists, but very multifaceted in our skill set, which makes us a kind of, a, you know, the oddball in a nature conservation environment, because we are small. We are privately independently funded, so we do not rely on the core funds by governments and therefore are really independent in our decision-making process. And we have a multitude of expertise. And our mission is very simple. We wanna identify the last bits of wilderness. We wanna help to designate them under the current uh, protection schemes that exist like IUCN, Natura 2000, National Parks. We then would like to help the locals to steward them, not manage, but there's a different webinar on what's different between stewardship and management, and obviously like to promote them, but more not the area, but the wilderness concept in general. And wilderness is not just the typical wilderness we always talk about in the European context. It includes wide coasts, which is exactly the Mediterranean protected area, and the landscape in one, wild forests, which are typically smaller in scale, wild islands, which are along the Danube, the Rhine, the Loire, in many, many rivers we have wild islands, and wild rivers. Uh, each one of those fours is a unique habitat, and wilderness is basically the potpourri. If it's not really a wild island or a wild river or a wild forest or a wild coast, it's wilderness. And Wilderness is defined on a European scale. Let me quickly just explain that to you. Wilderness is an area where absolutely no human intervention or extraction is anymore allowed. That means in the wilderness core zone, no, lo no logging, no mining, no hunting, no fire control, no invasive species control, nothing. That core zone is totally left up to itself. And that's why we don't use the word management, but stewardship, because we are just observers to see how nature deals with some of them human cost threats, some of them natural threats, and how it can recover from it. And 
Mark Fisher, who you may know from the university uh, in Leeds, is one of the godfathers of this idea. You may also call a wilderness a self-willed land. It does what it does at its own will, and we are just observers. So what does wilderness offer for us? Well, it is the most natural and best protected areas, hopefully, in the world, and there's only fragments of it left. But surprisingly, the more we look, the more wilderness we find. It has a very unique flora and fauna because like I said, we don't really do any rewilding or nature conservation in the wilderness. It therefore offers unique research opportunities because we can see how nature could deal, for example, with climate, the climate crisis without us interfering. And we could look at how does a natural area cope with climate crisis if we interfere by planting trees or building dams to keep water back or whatever. It typically covers the largest old growth forests in Europe. That's the, the majority of wilderness, but not limited to because we have steppes, we have deserts, and like I said, wild rivers, wild islands. So there's many other areas around it. Quite a few of them are World Natural Heritage Sites. And in the past, IUCN and UNESCO didn't like it but now they're getting used to these serial World Heritage Sites. So suddenly wilderness is also entering that arena. And you cannot have wilderness without the apex predators. Bear, wolf, lynx, wolverine up in the north, or as we just heard in the previous discussion, the leopards in India or the tigers. So without these apex predators, uh, wilderness has a problem. And thank God, in Europe, we already have 17,000 wolves, 140,000 golden jackals. The predators are on a comeback and therefore wilderness has a brilliant future. Now, the largest wilderness areas in Europe are listed on our map, the European Wilderness Network, and we currently have 41 areas. And if we would have more money, we most likely could even have 80 because Surprisingly, some of the areas that are out there are out there because we humans just had no value for it and therefore never logged it, never looked at it. We're not interested in it. And when you look through those eyes on those areas, you certainly find in Italy tens of thousands of hectares of land that was not used for the last couple of hundred years. Wilderness always has excellent carbon sequ sequestration, and we not even want to talk about the ecosystem services. But in all of these wilderness areas, they are typically in less developed rural regions. You do not really find a wilderness in Berlin or Paris. Uh, they are subject to a lot of interests. The logging companies want in there. The tourist people want in there. The locals, even if they want to only use local firewood, there is a, the hunters want in there because they want to hunt those beautiful big animals. So there's a lot of, lot of different stakeholders pulling on the fringes of wilderness. And last but not least, there's always the question, why don't we use the landscape? We humans are here to use the earth, the natural wonders. And it's difficult to understand that we are telling them, well, there is this little bit of area where you are not allowed to do anything. The rural landscapes around this wilderness, a little school, roads, not really there. They have a low income structure. Government funding is typically the only source of income in those rural areas. Very few professional jobs. Um, definitely not a lot of masters or bachelor thesis educated people out there. And the rural air is bleeding out. Even here in the Lunga, which is a biosphere reserve in Austria, 20,000 people, we are losing 400 people every year moving into the rural area. And that's in Austria. So we can just imagine what it's like in Ukraine or Georgia or other parts. But those rural areas, they need help, or at least they demand it, because, I mean, they need, if, if we talk about CO2 neutral economies, they need environmental safe infrastructure. They do need some roads. They need power and water. 
if we do not want them to cut down illegal the force. It would be great if there would be full-time employment opportunities for out there so that they can at least participate a little bit in the sharing of wealth. And I'm not Mr. Sanders here, but we truly believe that wealth should be shared to some degree. And I think everybody has a right for sustainable life. Now, wilderness of today is facing a gigantic problem because everything we do somehow gets attributed a dollar or you assigned to it. So even us nature conservationists are trying to put a value on protected areas. We just call it ecosystem service. But in reality, we are measuring the value of a tree by what that tree produces in ecosystem services. And if even we do that as nature conservationists, we can just see that the general public sees a good wilderness or a good national park as one which benefits us people. Seldom have I ever heard what can not we benefit from that area, but what can that area benefit from us not doing something? And, 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 it, and it's this belief that everybody has, everything and everybody has to serve the human race that is pushing a gigantic stress on nature conservation. So in case of wilderness, we expected that they contribute to alleviate climate change. We expect wilderness to help somehow local communities. We expect from wilderness that they protect biodiversity. We expect wilderness that scientists can do research in there for whatever reason. We, and last but not least, that also tourists should be allowed to visit it. That's what we demand from these areas. Spoken or not spoken, but it's the always underlying topic if you get into these stakeholders' approaches. Now, in virtually every case across the world, at one point in that discussion, the word comes back to tourism. And the big question is, is tourism the solution to all of these problems the rural areas face? Because it is sometimes being promoted as that magic something that helped the rural areas to overcome the neglect by our politicians and, and societies that we have just not been able to, to share with the rural areas and let them participate in the economic development of the general society. And who's pushing, who's promoting this tourism all the time? Well, politicians, because they just do not know how else to help a rural area. And they're not really interested either because the few votes that they get from a rural area is not really significant compared to the votes they get out of the urban population. NGOs, because we love to protect nature, that's what we do, that's in our genes. So if we wanna protect nature, we're looking for money, even we proclaim sustainable tourism, ecotourism, nature-based tourism. Locals, because they got nothing else unless it's nature and that's what they would like to somehow benefit from. And obviously the city slickers, because they love this wild thing because they see it as a new tourist destination. And a German author at one point in time said quite nicely, a tourist destroys what he or she seeks by finding it. And that's what we always have to keep in mind. Tourism is the fastest and surest way to destroy protected areas in nature. And I will go through that examples. Because if we talk about tourism, we talk about an industry. And the common denominator of all industries in the world, mining industry, logging industry, is exploitation. The tourist industry lives off exploiting nature to make money for, in, and, and they sell that nature in form of a product, a trip, a wilderness trip, a rafting trip. They package by using nature to then sell it to the tourists, but the money stays with the tourism industry. I have never seen a rafting company pay money to the local community for using a river for rafting. 
Never seen, never seen it. Not voluntarily, nor by law. And an industry is based on exploitation. So, the tourism life cycle across the world is something we must kind of keep in mind because tourism, with the start, already has the seeds of their own destruction in it. Because, and it goes through these six different phases, these cycles. You first explore it, you find a new location, tourists find it, they take a photo. Then they go home and they tell their friends, involvement. Then the tourism industry becomes involved and in saying, hey, we visited your area, why don't you think about putting up some hiking signs? Because our friends have said they always get lost while hiking. That then leads to development. Well, you got a hiking sign up, why didn't you build a shelter? Because if it rains, or it's cold weather, people will freeze. And by the way, if you go to shelter, why don't you set up a garbage can? But they demand that it's the government or local NGOs who do that. Tourist industry never pays or seldom pays for the development of the protected area or any area for its tourism. And they do that by holding up the carrot. If you build those, you know, put up the hiking signs, if you build the shelter, you will have more tourists and your local population will benefit. But they never reveal how the local population will benefit. After development, at one point it comes consolidation. It cannot grow indefinitely. It's almost like flattening the curve. Sorry, I used that from the corona, but every tourism cycle goes through flattening the curve. And that leads to stagnation. And at the point of stagnation, two things can happen. The area becomes so overcrowded that it just is not interesting anymore to the tourism industry. They just move on like a herbivore that is grazed off the field to move off to the next field. Or they reinvent themselves and rejuvenate. But that really is seldom the case. So I explained it to you. Exploration is the first step. And typically you see the first tourist local still benefits because they went to room in their house, in the farm. Uh, they may be selling a beer on the porch. But that first money that comes in gets a local to think about it. Well, if I can sell one beer, maybe I can sell two beers. If I can rent a one room, maybe I can rent out two rooms. <coughs> and that's then the involvement phase. Suddenly, local products are being sold to tourists. Uh, the first restaurants are opening up. You know, first still a local language, but suddenly they hire a waiter who can speak English. And you can nicely see that currently happening in Ukraine. You suddenly get, uh, um, you know, menus in two languages. Uh, marketing is still not done professionally, but it's starting to, it's starting to develop. And at that moment, bed and breakfast places replace private rooms. Parking lots are suddenly built. Entry fees maybe are being charged. Uh, small vendors are replaced by shops. You know, instead of selling the products on the street, they suddenly have a little tourist shop. Um, the roads are being improved because, you know, there's the demand for the bus companies. I would like a nice road to have. But also the first problems arise. Wastewater becomes a problem, the gray water issue. Garbage suddenly is increasing. And the first non-locals are being brought in. Like I said, the first English speaking waiters and whatnot. And then you read the consolidation phase where luxury chalets replace bread and breakfast places, where hotels are being upgraded from two, three stars to five star hotels. Foreign staff is hired, like in the Austrian tourist industry, virtually all waiters are from the Balkans. Not because we don't have unemployed people in Austria. No, because during consolidation, you're looking on the bottom line and waiters from the Balkans are willing to work for less money, more hours than people from Austria. There's almost no locals in Austria and we have how many four-star hotels? I think, we have, I think we have about a thousand bed and breakfast places and hotels for 20, in a region of 20,000 people. 
just the owners are still locals, but even they are being replaced by banks because in the consolidation phase, many hotels go bankrupt, banks take over, and then they put in a general manager. And locals are suddenly left to do the cheap labor. They end up just being the cleaning ladies or the truck driver or the, the piston, piston bully, you know, the, the, the snow making machine people, but not really out in the face of the tourists. And then becomes the stagnation because it literally costs too much money to maintain the hotels. Um, it becomes unattractive and uh, virtually it starts to break down, right? And in that decline phase, very few people can recover. Now, this is good example about a couple of photos. I mean, UNESCO World Heritage Site, Venice, everybody knows about it. Gigantic ocean liners right up to the Piazza San Marco. And if you know a little bit about a Venice, there are almost no locals living anymore in Venice. It's a ghost city. You look at the Grand, Grand Canyon. If you go to that place one minute later, it's empty because the tourists only come during the sundown. So you're building infrastructure to maintain a large group of people for maybe 10 minutes a day. In the other 23 hours and 50 minutes, very few people use that lookout. And Grand Canyon actually had to put in a lottery system for rafting because it is just out of control. This is my home, Salzburg, overrun by Japanese and Chinese tourists and Americans, by the way. Um, let's not even talk about Yosemite. Right on the right hand side, you see the Old Faithful. I didn't photograph Old Faithful. I photographed the steward, the tourists who are just there to take a photo of a geyser. This is a national park in China. Talking about COVID. <laughs> Another one. I mean, this is a peak at the end of the hiking trail. In protected areas, in wilderness areas. Let's not talk about Tanzania or even in Cyprus. But that's also the decline. Because here what you see are hotels on beaches, be beautiful prime spot, who just because they were not able to rejuvenate themselves are now left standing empty. And it will lead to further decline. It will lead to that whole Cyprus area starting to break down. A castle which was never finished because the tourism decided that then this area is not worthwhile visiting anymore. In Croatia, hotels left empty. So having, knowing all that negative side of tourism, is there even a win-win possible? And I think there is, but we need to think about tourism before we start with tourism, because tourism needs to be based on those three pillars. We need to take care of the environmental concerns, the economic concerns, and the social concerns. And we keep in mind that if only one of those three fail, the whole tourism structure breaks down. And often it is the environment which fails first. So let's look at some of the impacts tourism can have because we need to keep that in mind if we think about even promoting wilderness, uh, tourism in wilderness areas. Economic, yes, tourism can have a positive growth effect. It can bring in foreign investment. The real estate value can rise for the rural people. The standard of living increases for the local people. Suddenly the roads are nice and paved and they do not need to have four wheel drive anymore to get from one place to another. And maybe I can even sell some local products. But on the negative side, with tourism, the inflation increases, foreign labor moves in, the cost of living for locals rises. For example, here in the Lungau during Christmas time, we have a lot of volunteers working for us. 
we almost have no chance of getting them an apartment because all of the one bedroom apartments just seasonally are rented out to the waiters working over Christmas time in the hotels. In April, all of those seasonal apartments are empty again. So the cost of living over Christmas rises dramatically compared if we would not have to us. Speculation is suddenly happening. Farmers can sell their land and do not need to harvest any more crops on it. We have big BMW drivers or Mercedes-Benz drivers who own the hotels, but a lot of the locals still drive the old beat-up VW Beetle. Now we have got the Golf now, it's not the Beetle anymore. Loss of ownership, banks move in, finance these things, and very seasonal employment. There's almost very few jobs in the Lunga which are year long. You get a job at Christmas, you may get a job in the summertime, forget spring, forget fall. Environmental impacts, quite easily. Yes, if you have tourism in a wilderness, suddenly that wilderness name shows up in the press. You suddenly may have some money to do a little bit of that biodiversity protection and to preserve the heritage. On the other side, the tourists will destroy their habitat and the ecosystems. You often have a resource conflict. Like, are we going to use the water in a mountainous region to put for the snowmaking, or are we going to leave the water in the areas for the wetlands to still be wet? And it's so bad that in Obertau, on a ski resort not far from here, the police regularly has to stop the illegal, and this is in Austria, the illegal stealing of water for snowmaking. The amount of water we need for snowmaking in Austria will fill tank tar cars from here to Beijing if we put, put them on a train. Just imagine this. Pollution. They bring in plastic, they don't take it home. The surface gets sealed and traffic congestion. Social impacts. Yes, we suddenly can see other cultures. We, there's a cultural exchange. The quality of life increases. Locals can suddenly be asked a few questions in stakeholder processes. And yes, the apartments are being upgraded and so are the shopping centers. On the other hand, nobody will ask a local on how to build a shopping center because these shopping centers are built by large architectural firms who are building these major infrastructures all over the world. The cultural identity is lost. Will we now do a cultural dance for, as we used to do for 600 years, for us? Or are we gonna invite tourists in to let them see what our cultural tradition is? And, and the moment we do that, the whole fabric of that cultural tradition can change. And again, a good example is the Trachten, the person that we have in December. This is a tradition where these monsters come down from the mountains and you ever go into some of the videos, they are really gruesome looking, but the tradition ends with the arrival of St. Nicholas on the 6th of December. Well, guess what? The high season of tourists starts later. So the tourism industry would like this really fantastic event to continue after the 6th of December but then it is a tourist event. So, but they lure with money. So out of a tradition for thousands of years, it suddenly becomes a modified tradition to accommodate the demands and the wishes of the tourism industry. Let's not even talk about architectural pollution, loss of community, parking, prostitution, alcohol, where there's tourists, there's alcohol, where there's tourists, there's prostitution. Now, besides that, we must find an equilibrium. So if we have all the negatives and we are aware of them, we would like to focus how to minimize the negative impact and focus on the positive impact. So we must find an equilibrium that the local community can benefit economically without endangering the social network or even destroying the environment. And there's a couple of tools that are at our disposals how to do that. But the key thing of this is, 
that we need to do that before we start tourism development. Because once, and, and this is so much, I'm sorry if I make that connection, to COVID. Once you have the virus in you, it's difficult to get rid of it. It is way cheaper and way more effective to keep it out before you get it. And the tools we have is economic, regulatory, policy instruments, even some non-traditional ones. So what are some of the economic instruments at our disposals to reduce those negative impacts? Number one is charge the tourists an environmental tax. If they come here to enjoy our nature, yes, they pay the hotel some money, so the hotel owner, which is sometimes a bank, gets benefit from it, but let's raise a tax that benefits everybody in the region. And that tax could be used to finance schools or, uh, or, or do some environmental impact analysis and whatnot. Get them a second fee to finance the tourism infrastructure that they're using. Why should we pay for the pavement out of government money if the buses driving on the pavements are driving tourists back and forth. Let the tourists in the bus pay a fee that the bus can ride on a nicely paved road. But that's already an indication that we often have a, a challenge here. If the money comes in, we have to remind the local financial authorities that the money is then actively used for specific purposes. Because A, the tourists then demand, I'm paying so much money, why is the road still broken? So we should also communicate to the tourists how that money is being used. And so it, it, it's not as easy as just raising a fee, but we must think about how to communicate and how to be transparent and how to use that fee. The worst thing that we can do is charge an environmental fee, and then build a new office for the mayor. That should not be where the money is used for. Regulatory instrument, and the key one for every protected area, before anybody should start thinking about tourism, is to find the carrying capacity limits. Now, I suspect you're familiar with that term, but what it really means is, at a certain point in time, a system breaks down. Now we have to find the carrying capacity to, uh, limit in COVID at two meter distance. You take that measurement, we have now used it at a local swimming pool, and the local swimming pool can take 200 visitors. But we use the COVID, 10 square meters. If you use this two meter distance between one family and another, so we said 10 square meters is the space we need to not infect the others. You can use a similar model for this and saying a tourist, if he comes into a protected area, this trail, looking at the trail, can only take 50 people a day. Not 100, not 200. This parking lot can only take six buses. And you must define that because if you don't and you suddenly have 10 buses, we tend to immediately switch over and extend the parking, extend. And then we are in that visual cycle, extend, extend and build and build and build. More and more people come in and then we come to the flattening of the curve and then the decline. So if we define those carrying capacity at the beginning, everybody knows what we are getting into. But we can also then say, we're gonna build one parking lot for six buses and that's it for the next 20 years. We don't want 100 buses. And that leads to quotas and zonation. There should be some areas which are off limits. And we have to be careful about that because these no-go zones are becoming more and more difficult to enforce because every smartphone has got GPS on it. So if you take a photo of a beautiful beech forest tree, which is 600 years old, and the UNESCO World Heritage Site, and they post that on Instagram, with, I visited the oldest tree in Austria. Anybody can see on Google Maps where the hell that tree is. 
And believe me, the next tourist group will find that tree. <coughs> so it's not enough to just take a small little group. What we do with our rangers is they must leave their cell phones at home. And we take the photos and share it with the visitors. And there's a funny little thing. If you go into Picasa, which is a Google, a Google thing, the Berlin uh, communities are using it to identify uh, traffic um, hotspots. And it, it was amazing for me to see because it pinpoints the GPS data down to about a couple of feet. And they were looking at where are tourists breaking the rule. And down at the trade show, there is a, this old, looks like a mini Eiffel Tower. And it's a famous photo motor. And they looked at the picture and then looked at the GPS data. Where were the tourists standing who took that photo? And you take, you take a guess where the people were. In the middle of a major intersection. Because at that point, you had the best vantage view of that little Eiffel Tower. So they were not standing on the sidewalks. They were not standing on, 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 on private property. They walked into the middle of the road to take that perfect photo. Once the community identified this, so we can use that technology as well, they literally sealed off the walkways that it would be almost impossible to cross over these gates to make it into the middle of the road. So some of those tools we can use ourselves. So if, if you're involved in a protected area, go on to Flickr, go on to Instagram, pull up the photos, look at the GPS data, and you can see immediately where the tourists are right now. And by the way, this is also true for, uh, for many other apps. There's even some research already done by following the GPS profile of, of these biking apps and, and running apps. And you suddenly see movement where you do not think tourists even show up. We have institutional instruments like eco labels, property rights, building plans. You know, I mean, establishing at the beginning a, a zonation and building plan and saying hotels can only be built in that area is so important because if you don't do that, somebody will always sell a piece of plot to an, an, a real estate investor. And once the real investor comes in and says, I'm willing to be built in this little Ivansky uh, Oblast a hotel for 500 tourists, uh, no locals will say no. They will sell the land because they believe the lie that they will benefit from it. But we know they will not. And then we have non-traditional methods like blocking trails, taking out trails, uh, making the do not pave parking lots if they are muddy, full of holes, it limits the number of people that may go there by car. So there's many, many different tools. Uh, remove bridges. One of the things we always do at a parking lot, at a trailhead, you, poke up, you put up a big sign that says, beware, um, bears in the vicinity, please inform your next of kin when you, ex when you expect it to be home. And it triggers in the mind of people, oh shit, maybe I should not go here. Or do you have your pepper spray with you? Have you taken a course about how to engage in a bear encounter? That's one thing, working with scary tactics. The other one is do not build a big bridge. Put right on the parking lot, a ditch with muddy water underneath it and a tiny little tree, a, a, like, like a, a pole. And you have to literally balance across that pole to, to get into the trail. I'm sure that everybody with running shoes or high heels will not even try to walk that trail. Because they already see, oh, this is not a trail for city people. This is a trail for professionals. This is basically the underlying model I explained to you that before we start with tourist development, we should go through this model and, and look at the different interactions before we develop a tourist development plan. And yes, 
This is also an ongoing process because maybe we overestimated the carrying capacity limit and we must take some back. Or we find out that we were too cautious. Or we found out that maybe the tourists are somewhere where we never expected them to be. But it's clear again, the pillars, it's not just the making it easy for tourists to come, but always ensuring that the locals will benefit from it. So as a summary, before we go into a fun discussion with you guys, we have to risk to sacrifice the protected areas and wilderness for short-term economic gains promised by the tourism industry. And we have to think outside of the box. We sometimes have to question, is tourist really the Hail Mary that will help the locals? Maybe it is something completely different. We also have to convince the local community that a 500 bed hotel may be actually not the best idea, but instead of having 10 bed and breakfast places. We have to focus on those pillars. We have to work with signs, which is more and more difficult because signs is some, by some people not regarded highly. And we must implement those guardrails before we start the investment. And we should have a long-term vision. And we always must have thresholds. And this is very good. Again, we can go back to this R value in COVID. If it reaches a certain limit, and the Czech, for example, have done this, they now have established on most of the tour trails cameras that do not take a photo, but they count. And the moment that they have got a carrying capacity quota on the hiking trails, and these are live, so they, they, they give to the, center, to the National Park live data. And once there's too many tourists on the trail, it signals the National Park authorities and they will send out a ranger and they close the trail. And the rangers then can even find if somebody still goes onto the trail. So this is using technology for intelligent tourist management ideas. Again, always trying to limit the impact. So if we do it right, sustainable nature tourism can positively impact local communities. It can generate income for these areas and it can possibly positively impact those rural areas, but only if we do it right from the very beginning. So, I heard some of you have never come across us before, before we now go into discussion. The main website is wilderness-society.org. And from there, you can also go into the network where we now have 42 areas listed as being absolutely no human intervention areas from Scandinavia to Georgia, from Portugal to the Ukraine. And this is Academy is I think where you log